Good afternoon and welcome to our online event. Uh, my name is Christoph Busch. I'm a professor of European business law at the University of Osnabrück and an affiliated fellow at the Information Society project at Yale Law School. Uh, this moment, uh, at this moment, I'm joining you from Stirling University in Scotland, where I'm currently a visiting professor. Uh, but uh, actually, I'm here in my capacity as a uh, research fellow, and I have the pleasure to guide you through the next 60 to 75 minutes. Uh, as a matter of housekeeping, let, let me briefly mention that this meeting is being recorded. I hope this is fine for all of you. And in today's online event, we will focus on one key element of the new regulatory framework for online intermediaries in the European Union, and that is the systemic risk assessment under the Digital Services Act. This is a new and interesting regulatory tool which does raise a lot of practical questions. And therefore, I'm really glad that we have a wonderful panel of experts that uh, is able to bring some light uh, into this uh, issue. First of all, Sally Broughton Mikova and Andrea Kalev are with us. They have just published uh, a new SAR report on this topic, and they will share with us uh, the main findings of their research. And then they will be joined by three leading experts from academia, civil society, and uh, national regulatory authorities who have kindly accepted our invitation to discuss the findings uh, of uh, the report. It's uh, Owen Bennett from Ofcom, the UK's telecom regulator, Professor Joris van Hoboken from the University of Amsterdam, the Freie Universiteit Brussels, and Luisa Maria Stasi from the NGO Article 19. And we are also counting on you in our discussion. So please uh, feel free to share with us any questions that you would like us to uh, discuss or address. So for this, you can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. I hope you can see it. Um, and now let me start uh, our first part by introducing our first two speakers. We first have Sally Broughton Mikova. She is uh, academic co-director at SER and an associate professor in communications policy and politics at the University of East Anglia. And her research mainly focuses on media and communications policy in Europe. So she's the right person to, to talk uh, to us on, on the Digital Services Act. And the same goes for her co-author, Andrea Kalev. He's a lecturer in economics at the University of East Anglia and a research member of their Center for Competition Policy. Andrea is an expert also in banking, systemic risk and international finance, as well as competition. Now, I'm very curious to learn more about the findings of your report. So Sally and Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, and uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for listening to us today. Uh, and I will apologize. My neighbor suddenly started cutting the grass behind me. I hope you can hear it as much as I can. Uh, so, uh, Andrea and I have um, uh, worked uh, very hard in the last several months on this issue of systemic risk. Um, we're going to present today something uh, that comes from uh, research that we published in July. Conrad, if you can switch to the next one, um, that speaks directly to this issue. So, our report looked at elements for effective systemic risk assessment, and what we did was go back to some of the other areas, in particular the finance and banking, uh, where systemic risk has, is a concept that's been used for a long time. So you have the QR code there if anyone wants to um, have a look at the report or at least the executive summary. What work we're going to do today is go into a little bit of it um, that speaks directly to the question at hand. Now, what do we expect from these systemic risk report um, assessments? So you may know at the end of August, those designated services um, have uh, submitted theirs. Um, so we, 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 we haven't seen these yet, right? But what we will be talking about is what our research showed that we should be and we hope to be seeing out of this process. So we will just go through um, some of the key findings uh, initially and, and then uh, speak to certain areas of our expectations. So 
Next slide, please. Um, what we looked at was in particular how the concept was operationalized in the finance and banking sector. Uh, we were looking for what assumptions were being made and what were the normative underpinnings, which means what kind of values were we talking about when we were talking about systemic risk in these systems. And in what we also also looked at a bunch of, um, you know, a, a range of literature about how uh, what we call VLOPs and VLOSAs, very large online platforms and very large online search engines, what how they operate, what are we talking about when we might be talking about harm. So we put those two things together uh, uh, to think about how the experience from other sectors might um, translate uh, into systemic risk when it comes to very large um, digital services. And of course, it's not a perfect match, but there was quite a lot um, to be learned. Um, you know, concepts do not translate exactly from one area into another, but we did find actually a surprising amount that we thought was useful and, and gave us clear indications of what we should um, hope to expect from these assessments. So I'll hand it over to Andrea now to run through quickly some of our key findings, and then we'll speak to those um, three areas where we have expectations. Thanks a lot, Alice. Thanks a lot, Christoph, for the kind presentation. Thanks a lot for all the audience for being here. And um, it was really a systematic approach, the one that we took. We tried to give a look to all the fields, but the reality is that systemic risk has been mostly developed over the last uh, decades in finance, more specifically in banking, not exclusively in banking. And, and so we had to start from that from my original field. And then every system, that's what we noticed, even if there is not a clear cut sometimes definition, has certain characteristics, certain components. For example, there are various players that, uh, that are part of this system and their interaction is going to be key. So what we noticed is that it's not just the nature the typology, like the size, is it a large player, a small player, the business type, was it a commercial bank or was it a, an Islamic bank or a cooperative bank, for example, but is also how they are interlinked. So the system is also defined by the relationship that these uh, players, the banks, in a, and then when we will translate in the digital platforms, uh, field is going to be the VLOPs and the small nodes which could be users like you and me and they really evolve over time and the type of relationships will affect the likelihood that a systemic crisis could occur, could be even propagated or uh, diminished, uh, mitigated. And that's really rather interesting in finance and uh, but everything is even if you can use very complicated models quite well identifiable and computed at the end of the day you will compute something in monetary terms when we try to make this bridge with the VLOPs below say well we understood that actually is not just a system is an ecosystem why because each VLOP is a system per se, and you may have multiple users that are not just unique users of a single system, but they may be uh, working, acting across multiple, multiple uh, system, which means that we are in an ecosystem quite heterogeneous. Not only, but these very large platforms, they also somewhat play some sort of regulatory role. So, they are players, but they're also regulators, and these can create opportunities, but also uh, potential issues. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Thanks a lot. Uh, certainly, the, the field of finance has been very rich in defining the type of shocks that could perturbate this ecosystem and system. We can distinguish various types of shocks, such as exogenous shocks, shocks that come from outside the system, I don't know, uh, geopolitical events. Uh, unfortunately, very recently, we are experiencing many of them. 
or endogenous, something that is due to one of the players. For example, the central bank, which is the main one of the main regulators in, in uh, the banking and finance system, is also is also a, a player and can change through the monetary policy uh, decisions the interest rate. That's an endogenous shock. It could be an, an idiosyncratic shock, which is a, a shock that affects a single uh, player or it could be a systemic shock. It's a shock that um, contemporaneously affect multiple players, and if it's very severe, could affect the whole system. And what we found is uh, actually is very good for BLOPs as well, because BLOPs are affected by all these types of shocks. But there is something more that we should consider. That's not a perfect translation, as Sally was saying. There, there could be also some minor shocks that accumulate over time and, and they may become eventually, after a certain critical mass, systemic. That's something that has been overlooked quite a lot in finance, but is going to become very relevant in platforms. And now Sally will tell us a little bit more about accumulation of repeated minor ramps. Thanks, Andrea. I think one of the you know, clearest examples of this is the kind of pollution effect that you might get from um, continuous derogatory comments to hate speech or even speech that is borderline illegal hate speech and borderline simply offensive or the kind of trolling that we see sometimes online, especially of female journalists or people of minority backgrounds. So there is this kind of pollution effect that we're also dealing with um, when it comes to very large online platforms that isn't necessarily captured by the concept of shock. Right? Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of negative effects, which are what is what the DSA refers to. The DSA requires these risk assessments to look at the potential for negative effects in a variety of very wide risk areas. Uh, and these risk areas are not very clearly defined. So unlike in banking, where we know that when everyone's out of money and the system collapses, you know, when there's no more money to be lent out or things that that's collapsed, right? It's a, you can put a value on it, as Andrea said. We don't really know what failure of civic discourse looks like. We don't have a an agreed definition that has been given to platforms to say this is what failure looks like in electoral processes or in relation to public health. Right. So we need to really do some definitional work here to define the risk areas. So one of the things that we are really hoping to see out of this, I think the, the first step, the first attempt at doing risk assessments is the beginning of a process where we define these risk areas. And what we have here um, in this illustration is some of the ways that you could define risk areas in a more um, in, in in an inclusive and multi-stakeholder way. On some things, it's going to be clear. Even one incidence of child sexual exploitation content is a failure, right? That is, you know, at a very micro level, it's an instant failure. But when we're talking about things like electoral processes, we have an election integrity project that has a lot of measurements. When we're talking about freedom of expression and media pluralism, we have various different indices. We have various stakeholders um, civil society groups, academics, and industry people who um, have tools that could be used to construct some ideas about what is the good <laughs> and what is the failure, and then what then are the negative effects that we're looking for in terms of risk assessment, and that would be our equilibrium. What is it that we want to try to achieve in terms of mitigation and risk balance? Right, because we are talking about management. We're not going to be talking about always achieving perfect. <laughs> right, we're trying to make sure there isn't failure, and we're trying to make sure management. So this is one of the areas where we really have a clear expectation. We want this risk assessment process now to kick off um, a, a process of defining these now for the next rounds and for future assessment. The next slide, space. So um, Andrea mentioned the systems and what we've done here is a very, very simplified illustration, right? This would have to be 
done by um, very systematic uh, network analysis, but it is certainly something that can be done. Um, but in the once these risk areas are defined, it should be pretty um, possible for the ecosystems to be defined. And what we have here is an illustration of an integrated ecosystem. You can see there are five very large online platforms or very large online search engines. They're in two groups, so you could understand the two on the right on one side that are owned by one provider, three owned by another provider, and then you have multiple actors. A multi-channel network, for instance, these are groups that represent influencers, right? Sort of like agents for influencers. So they have contracts with advertisers, contracts with in, in influencers, and they probably have contracts with service providers of the platforms as well. So those are various connections, relationships, which could be potentially sources of risk, but also could be locations for potential mitigation. If certain rules are put in contracts, if certain monitoring or contract compliance is being done by these. So it could be an ally in mitigation, for instance. You see yellow, a troll farm, right? We do have the DSA recognizes this kind of exogenous shock of intentional manipulation by malicious sources, right? So we could have troll farms set up that are operating on multiple um, very large online platforms. And when these things are identified, there, there is probably a need for some communication among the service providers that are affected by the, these common sources of risk. Yeah. So this is the kind of mapping, although on a much more large scale and in a much more complicated um, uh, process, that should be done in order to really assess, we think, risk um, in, in these different areas. Uh, next slide, please, Conrad. And then the last area where we have expectations stemming from this report is in terms of the heterogeneity of identifying sources of risk. Right? So what we would like to avoid is simply a tick boxing exercise where services say we have this kind of content moderation, we have these rules in our um, terms of service, and therefore check, 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 we've taken down this much content every year <laughs> without really assessing what are the sources of risk and looking more holistically at the harm that might be happening. Um, some factors here, whether or not something is exogenous or endogenous, is this stemming from internally or externally? And the DSA very clearly has a focus on both. It wants to assess risk that stems from design, functionality, and algorithms. Those are all internal, right? Those are endogenous sources of risk and exogenous sources of risk, like you know, intentional manipulation from external sources, of course, massive risk to public health, et cetera, those things can come from outside. And then the, we want to see the, source, the service providers not just looking at their own systems and their own measures, but also how their system that they govern interacts with others. Right? and whether or not there are things that are affecting a lot of them simultaneously. Now, we'll talk in a little bit about some of the challenges that might pose um, in terms of competition, but if we really are serious about preventing harm to society and controlling these risks, we might have to tolerate a little bit of communication and cooperation in some of these areas. And then again, we have this issue of user behavior versus platform components. I mean, there are certain things that the platform can very clearly control all by itself. And then there are things that it has to be mitigating to the best of its ability, such as user behavior. So these are things, these are um, four areas where we found the experience from the financial sector quite useful in terms of, of um, of identifying ways of categorizing and being thorough about assessing the risks. So I'll just let Andrea make some of our concluding remarks from our report, and then we really look forward to the discussion. Andrea. Thanks a lot, Sally. And thank you, Cora, for switching to the similar slide. So just to summarize a little bit the conversation that we had so far, 
uh, we understood that we cannot fully translate uh, all the concepts from finance to the digital platforms. For example, the issue of what is a failure uh, in uh, mitigating a risk is still to be debated and decided. And the same risk areas, once that a risk assessment must be implemented, need to have some testable uh, definitions, not super broad definition. They will have to become something that can be monitored and then auditing companies will make their own assessment on whether there was a certain goodness of the work or not. So uh, what uh, is probably needed uh, is to have uh, this multi-stakeholder process to have this definition of failures and risk areas also in a more detailed man uh, manner within each risk area. Certainly, uh, the DSA provides convening powers to the European Commission. Uh, European Commission will be pivotal. It's going to be very, very relevant to have many stakeholders on board because there, as Ali mentioned, there could be some sort of conflict of interest even within different rights and then some sort of compensation needs to be agreed together. Um, the accumulation of, of minor negative shocks which could become minor negative arms is to be considered because we are doing the assessment. The assessment is a picture, but then the assessment is going to be uh, repeated over time. And even if the regulation uh, requires uh, to send this picture once per year, then the assessment must be continuous. And if there are particular risk areas that need to be timely monitored and there should be an intervention. This requires that the whole network and the shocks are monitored in a periodic manner. So to the next slide, please. We can also add that it's key to better understand the nature of the different players and the, the slides where there was a sketch of the system. You could have seen the different colors. Uh, the different sizes of, of the interconnections. Uh, these are, are different players that have different incentives to behave. So an additional study on them is needed. And there is the need, depending on the type of risk area that we are considering, that perhaps an endogenous shock is more monitored than an exogenous one or vice versa. So it's going to be tailored, tailored to the risk area, tailored to the typology of the VLOP because every VLOP is different and has a different uh, algorithms to work. And, and some things may change over time because this relationship change over time. And for certain aspects, for the core nodes, the very large, nodes that work across the different platforms, we also think that collaboration is needed. I know pretty much that those that are uh, very much interested into competition will be raising uh, many question marks, but cooperation doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that there will be collusion. And when there is the conflict of these very relevant concepts like having fair competition, but also avoiding harm, a compromise will need to be found. We also notice that, of course, uh, VLOPs are firms, they want to maximize their profits, so it's likely that they will put a, a different level of effort in monitoring and mitigating. As long as a minimum requirement is achieved, and this should not be set by uh, these players themselves, because of course there would be a conflict of interest, uh, then that would be a very legitimate uh, business choice. We also, as Sally anticipated, noticed that the auditing companies will play a key role in advising and also uh, auditing this risk assessment. This is completely new. There is no previous information. Yes, Many auditing companies have expertise on financial report, financial auditing reporting, but that is a very different area. Cannot be easily translated. And some of them now works quite a lot also on sustainability auditing report. 
the sustainable financial uh, disclosure directive certainly will uh, provide additional additional work for these companies but who is able to make this very necessary initial huge investment only probably the largest auditing companies and the largest auditing companies are also those that do financial auditing reporting sustainability reporting and auditing reporting and by law they are required to swap over time and given that is a very concentrated market we are afraid that in the very short run there won't be any auditing company that would be able to do this DSA risk assessment simply because of this puzzle that needs to be solved in swapping around there could be potential solutions something that we have proposed in a response to a consultation paper on uh, on the DSA uh, risk assessment auditing companies that the European Commission issued but we would like also to hear from you so I think it's time to give the floor back to our moderator Thank you uh, so much, uh, Sally and uh, Andrea, for this uh, really interesting uh, overview um, uh, of your uh, research results and the learnings that uh, a platform regulation could actually take uh, from uh, finance uh, regulation. And also you, you have mentioned some, some of the differences that are uh, clearly uh, to be seen between these sectors. Uh, we have now the opportunity to discuss the findings of the study and the broader context of the systemic risk uh, assessment. And we will start with some first reactions uh, from our three panelists, and then we will open the discussion by bringing in your questions. So please feel feel free to, to provide us your questions. Uh, I, th I think we have roughly 100 people in, in this virtual room, so I'm sure there must be some uh, questions. Um, so please uh, uh, share them with, with us. But before that, let me briefly introduce our uh, panelists. Um, first, we have Owen Bennett. Uh, he's uh, the international online safety lead at Ofcom, the United Kingdom's independent communications regulator. He's an expert in policy issues related to the regulation of illegal and harmful content online, but he has also worked across many other areas of uh, digital policy, including cybersecurity, competition, and privacy. And then we have Joris van Hoboken. He's an associate professor at the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam and a professor uh, of law at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels. He has been a member of the EU uh, Observatory on the Online Platform Economy. Actually, we have been colleagues uh, uh, there. And he has recently launched a new and very interesting project that focuses on the implementation of the Digital Services Act. And that's the uh, Amsterdam-based DSA Observatory uh, project. Really, really interesting project. And last but certainly not least, we have Maria Luisa Stasi. She's a competition lawyer uh, with a, a, a background in media, telecoms, digital sectors, and she currently leads the law and policy work on digital markets at Article 19, which, as you know, is an NGO focusing on the freedom of expression and freedom of information. So we have a broad range of expertise here. Let me start with Maria Luisa. Um, what is your first reactions to the findings of, of the report? Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I'm not sure if you can see me, but at least I hope you can hear me. Uh, my first reaction is to thank you for involving me in this conversation. And also my first reaction is I wish we could have at least 10 of these sessions to discuss everything we need to discuss about the topic. Uh, but um, I guess there is uh, a couple of things that I might want to sort of uh, uh, add to the table to trigger even more questions and discussions. I don't have answers, but uh, preparing for this uh, intervention, I think I have identified a couple of good questions. So that's that's the aim uh, today. Um, I very much liked the comparison, I think, um, between the two sectors. I think it's a very good way to start learning. And I do 
like also the fact that in a way or another you, you both you have set a research agenda for you know identifying gaps what's still needed etc it seems to me one of the the things you have discussed the most is this idea of having a multi-stakeholder process in um in in, in the entire process i i do believe uh, i'm not sure if that was your uh, intention but i do believe that here we have two sort of a quite separate although in a continuous uh, uh, elements the first one is to very much um clarify key concepts and, and see how the multi-stakeholder process can work into the clarification of those concepts while we do the risk assessment. And the other one, and the risk assessment and the risk mitigation exercise, and the other one is the other side of all this. And I do believe that the multi-stakeholder process can be uh, very helpful in both cases. But let me let me uh, try to uh, put the questions first. So why a multi-stakeholder process and how a multi-stakeholder process? Uh, so why? I think there are there are a number of reasons, and some have, uh, when I was thinking about those, some make sense, and others, they appear much more fundamentally, uh, uh, sorry, structurally fundamental. Um, you've, you mentioned in a comparison that we can have idiosyncratic and systemic risks, and I think the DSA focus very much on the systemic risks. So, um, Sally, you've mentioned also the uh, pollution effects, and in general, in the report, you talk uh, rightly so about interactions among play players, contagion, propagation, uh, cross-platforms, transmissions, etc. So it's clear to me that most of the time we're talking about an environment where the risk event depends on the act of a single platform, but also on the act of a number of other players. And if not the risk event per se, definitely the negative consequence that might arrive uh, from the risk event. Uh, so it is um, a, a wider environment that we're looking at. Uh, and there are value play players involved. Uh, two, um, I also liked uh, very much this focus on the multitude of minor shocks, because that uh, also, I think, uh, um, sort of a, a highlights how important it is also to look at the user's behaviors or the, at the other peripheral platform's behavior. So once again, a confirmation of that. I think the DSA in itself hints in that direction with recital 82 and article 45.2 when they talk about code of conducts, if the, there is this uh, um, assumption that, well, if, if, if uh, it verifies that uh, uh, the risks are shared across the platforms. Um, so those are all good set of reasons but also th there are other uh, elements so the risk assessment and the mitigation exercise they do uh, include an, a variety of normative concepts and they have also uh, necessarily imply value judgments uh, so if we have different approaches to how we interpret normative concepts or the kind of value judgments that we make, we're going to have different results. And you have you have already hinted at some of them. Uh, so let's let's look at the negative consequences where I think that the value judgment is more evident. Um, and the DSA talks about severity, so it takes this into account as well. This interpretive exercise, I would say, um, if we talk about free expression, damages to free expression. Uh, I'll try to oversimplify with concrete example, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we can have, for example, content removal of uh, nudity. And then we can think about uh, different approaches to look at that and see which kind of negative consequence it can have. So the risk event is we remove the content. The negative consequence we attach for free expression depends on the approaches. Why so? If we take a sort of a utilitarian perspective, then we can say, depending on the kind of platform uh, and on the kind of um, actor that has put the context, uh, the, the content on that we remove. Uh, if it is a mainstream uh, uh, user or, or the ma a user that, that pertains to a mainstream category, then if we remove this, the, the, the user uh, might have other options in other platforms, so one element to consider. The other element to consider is this kind of content will circulate in any case. So maybe the impact on free expression is A. But if we take a, the, uh, a, a different approach and we say a more deontological approach, whatever kind of removal, it doesn't matter if it is a minority or majority uh, kind of content, let's say coming from a minority or majority uh, kind of user, or if there are or uh, there aren't any other possibilities to circulate the same content in other platforms, in any case, there will be a damage on free expression. So 
those are two, of course, oversimplified example of extremes, but uh, I, I think we can agree that then the impact is going to be measured in a completely different way. And so the mitigation measures will be tailored in a completely different way. And this is the same for, for other risks as well. Uh, plurality of media. Uh, plurality of media. How much diversity is enough diversity? How much uh, diversity of exposure of content is enough diversity of exposure? So, you know, we need criteria, we need benchmark. And, and to do that, we need also uh, normative concepts. At, at the beginning. Um, the point is, is this an exercise that needs to be performed by the platforms themselves only? Or is this an exercise that implies also balancing different interests and values in society? I would say the second, so I would say traditionally a multi-stakeholder process should be the one to go for. Um, not to say that, you know, uh, we've seen that there is a, a, a big risk of privatization of, of regulation and of the enforcement of regulation and this this very large online platforms very large online search engine they already have a sort of a regulatory role in the environment so if we include in the mitigation measures for example something that needs to be implemented by other players as well and not only by them in order to uh, actually mitigate the risk the systemic risk and not only the idiosyncratic risk then in a way we're even if attributing even more power to the very large online platforms to set the standard of the behaviors for other players as well. So I do insist, I think the multi-stakeholder process is the way to go for all this, this long uh, set of reasons from the very beginning, not only for the oversight, but also in the risk assessment exercise and in the risk mitigation exercise to clarify all these concepts. Now, the second question is how, how we do this? Um, not easy, absolutely not easy. Uh, I think, there are a number of challenges in whatever model we're gonna we're gonna uh, go for. Uh, one is the adequate representation, how we can select who should be part of this multi-stakeholder process, considering the variety of risks that we're we're gonna deal with. Um, the national versus European dimension. It is true that we're talking about a European regulatory framework, but it's also true that maybe some minorities or some risks they impact local areas or national areas more than others. So how do we play with this? Who is paying? Um, Andrea just mentioned uh, that auditing will need huge investments at the beginning, and maybe you know very few players will be able to do this. Well, multi-stakeholder process. Who is paying for this? Who is going to put the money for this to actually work? And then access to information and access to data. Uh, in order to do a proper work, of course, whoever sits in this multi-stakeholder process needs to do to have uh, adequate information. Um, and so on and so on. The it's a long list of, of challenges. Um, I just want to conclude by throwing two possible ways to go, I would say. One, uh, I mentioned uh, a report has been put together by Professor Susanna Verniole um, very recently, which is about uh, putting, uh, the title is putting collective intelligence to the enforcement of the Digital Services Act. And in a way, she sort of uh, um, tries to address um, a number of these challenges, a number of these questions. and her proposal is to put together an expert group that the Commission could consult and work with in the implementation of, of a number of DSA prov uh, provisions. So maybe this could be one way to go, um, the expert uh, group. Uh, it could also be in line with Article 64 of the DSA, I would say, which is you know de about developing union expertise and capability. Uh, the other possibility that I've heard about is uh, the idea of, of being uh, helped by uh, social media accounts or uh, sim uh, instruments similar to the media, uh, sorry, the Meta Oversight Board. Uh, I would be a little bit more cautious about those because um, there are some, some important premises there. So if we do consider these councils to be very much attached to the individual platform, we might not moving in the right direction. Because I do believe that this is a, a broader conversation to be to be um, held by society. And so to sort of uh, attach uh, this kind of solutions to the specific platform rather than to the system, to the environment, uh, it might lead to very fragmented solutions. Um, and because there are value judgments involved, I'm not sure fragmenting the value judgments um, across different parts of societies is uh, it could be the the optimal uh, results. Um, I've taken too much time. Uh, I'm happy to elaborate. I also have many other comments if we have the time, but I want to definitely leave the space to others uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Luisa, for uh, these uh, uh, very clear ideas on why and how to, to organize the, the multi-stakeholder process. And I'm sure that, uh, uh, Joris, uh, you, you have also 
uh, uh, views on on uh, what the role of academia could could be in such a uh, multi-stakeholder process or any other comment that, that you would like to to share with us yeah that's i mean it's it's interesting that you bring up the role of academia it's something of course also mentioned in the report we have uh, this innovative article 40 research access uh, that has a very clever uh, cleverly designed relationship to in the like medium term you know, really starting to involve the risk-based uh, approach uh, that is put in the in the DSA uh, for the very large uh, services, and uh, so there is definitely a role for uh, research organizations there uh, to making this work. Maybe in the first and second iteration, uh, there will be some disappointment about the risk definition uh, process by the companies and and you know what is picked up, but over time. You know, research uh, using uh, platform data can start to inform uh, this exercise. So that is uh, there's a role uh, for academia. I wanted to maybe contrast a little bit of thinking that I've had uh, in relation to the risk-based approach in the DSA to what is done in the report. Uh, you know, not not to push back, but just to kind of uh, you know. Uh, speak to what I think is is really one of the central challenges in uh, making this work in the long run. So, I mean, obviously, and this is a very valuable exercise, there there is a lot of kind of risk-based uh, regulation and thinking in other industries and other, other sectors. And, and this report in particular looks at the financial sector, where there's a lot of uh, experience with that in, in very particular ways. And it's like, and I think you the report does a very good job in in really finding like all these very particular dynamics that you also see in finance how how would that carry over and how would the system thinking carry over to uh, to the platform regulation context so i'm i'm kind of like i mean this is just my own historical uh, trajectory i i i uh, I indoctrinated myself with intermediary liability law and and kind of you know online service regulation thinking you know, like starting in the basically in the 90s, of course, but we have a longer history of like law dealing with information intermediaries of various kinds, like libraries and publishers and, and all these things. So and thinking about, you know, that legal framework that we have had and how that has kind of also developed over time and how the DSA is trying to do something and intervene or build something on top, you know, but still like it's still in the same tradition or like kind of legal regulatory tradition of uh, of of dealing with uh, with certain forms of facilitating into intermediary platform types of uh, services and so we have this risk based approach uh, in the DSA it's very clearly it's part of the asymmetric uh, part of the DSA of course and it's basically i mean the politics of that has been we need to create we have more leverage over these very large platforms from a societal perspective you know over and we we need to create more accountability for how they're dealing with certain very clear kind of uh, risk areas uh, but also to do that within a rule of law based setting, because obviously what has happened over time, there has been like political politics with the platforms, the largest ones and all sorts of self regulatory co regulatory dynamics. The TSA is really an attempt to to structure this in a in a rule of law based framework with with oversight and, and auditors involved. So really quite an innovation uh, in this space and very exciting. But there is, of course, quite a bit of continuity still with what we had and what we still also have in place. You know, the DSA has a lot of the classics still there. We had have and still have like the liability and the rights based approach uh, to uh, to the online uh, space. You know, and I think what what we all I think uh, started realizing, but I mean maybe 20 years ago you already saw protests about it. Like the liability was really intended to be just about the specific instances of illegal content and what a platform ended up doing, and and there were some attempts to jump to, but hey, you know, like you're you have you you must know that you're you have this awareness that there is this problem on your platform, you know, like you're you're offering a video sharing site, you know, like it's just full of copyright infringement, you know, like you cannot just reduce your responsibility 
to dealing with specific instances in a notice and takedown kind of way. You know, I think the DSA, what it does is to move to this more systemic perspective and it creates a framework also for doing that. So, and a lot of it is still linked to the rights-based approach. You know, a lot of it is still linked to illegal content categories and also it flags very importantly the fundamental rights dimensions, you know, that are implicated in, in online uh, illegal and harmful content uh, dynamics. So, personally, I feel that what should happen is that uh, we really have to do a lot of thinking and how that risk-based approach, um, you know, complements, uh, but has uh, very important synergies and can work together, you know, with uh, the liability and, 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 uh, and, and rights-based approach. You know, those, the rights-based approach is not uh, going to go away. It's actually put, it's pulled into the risk-based approach with the reference to illegal content, with the reference to fundamental rights and other kind of, you know, legal anchors. So I find that uh, incredibly uh, important. And maybe just to give to close, like a very specific example of also the way that you can kind of think about that in my mind, you know, like if you're if you're a site that, uh, that, that does video sharing, if you have offered that kind of service, you know, there are particular types of problems. You just know that you're going to have those problems. And we all know that you're going to have those problems. You know, like you're going to have issues with uh, copyright infringing materials on your site. If you're doing an online shopping site, you know that you're going to have issues with trademarks. You're going to have issues with counterfeit uh, goods. You know, those are just kind of just completely intrinsic to your operations. You know, like, so it just makes sense, you know, for those kinds of things to be picked up in a, in a framework like that. And I think the risk-based approach makes it possible to do that. And I think those are just kind of risks that relate very clearly to the, to the particular type of, you know, functional service that you're offering. And then there are particular risks that, that really relate to the ways that you organize and operate your platform, you know, with particular algorithmic mechanisms, you know, that it's like, Obviously, if you have a timeline kind of mechanism or search results that are taking a lot of open signals in the way that things are being organized, like that's open to manipulation, you know, and there are particular types of manipulation that are more easy to deal with than others. And so there are some kind of intrinsic risks uh, connected to that. And I think the DSA does a good job in, in pointing out how those kinds of things can and should be worked with in this, uh, in this, in this context. And uh, let me leave it with that. This being exciting to be. Uh, thanks very, very much for the for the invitation. Be excited to uh, to read your uh, report and uh, look forward to to hearing more from the others and uh, and seeing this kind of you know feed into the bigger conversation. Thank you very much, Joyce, especially for uh, uh, pointing out the link uh, between the rights-based uh, approach and this systemic uh, approach there, uh, and uh, how the DSA tries to, to build a bridge, in a, in a sense, be between these, these two approaches. And I think it will be very interesting to, to, to see how, how that will uh, play out. And this brings us to our third panelist, uh, uh, Owen Bennett. Uh, do you share? The views that uh, just have been uh, mentioned or do things look a bit different from the perspective of a national regulator i'm very curious to to learn um thank you christoph no they were they were incredibly interesting interventions and i really enjoyed the opportunity to read the paper and to to hear the presentation from sally and andrea today i'll try to give some feedbacks from from how this kind of work impacts on the questions that we are asking ourselves as regulators. The obvious caveat being that as Ofcom, while we are doing risk assessment frameworks, we are not doing a systemic risk assessment framework as per the DSA because of a little thing called Brexit. Uh, but nonetheless, many of the questions here are quite, uh, quite important for the work that we're doing. There was three kind of overarching points I wanted to make based off the the learnings from the paper and the discussion we've been having. One is that um, very clearly risk assessment frameworks are becoming a new norm in global online safety regulation or platform accountability regulation, however you want to determine it. And while the, the content of these frameworks may differ, like the types of risks that services and companies are having to assess, the form is very similar, like how we expect these risk assessments to be undertaken. And when, in that context, when you have these similar types of assessments taking place 
in different places, many of the same companies having to do them in different jurisdictions, it does mean that international coordination and alignment amongst regulators and amongst those who are trying to influence the risk assessment process is going to be critical because these are very novel and very innovative spaces for, for our policy domain. And I think that's an area where when I, when I look to the banking sector and the experience we have with financial services, I think it is something that we can learn because in that domain, there is quite enhanced international, regional and international coordination. And while our sector has its own idiosyncrasies and we're dealing with instances of national law and different cultures around free expression and so forth, I do think we have a lot of opportunity to collaborate regionally and internationally around broader risk assessment frameworks for online safety. The second point I wanted to make is just around what is the role and what is the purpose of risk assessments, whether they're risk assessments for illegal content or more broadly for systemic issues around um, societal harms. And it has been mentioned a number of times that what we don't want is risk assessments to be tick box exercise. I think everybody agrees on, on that, or at least everybody will publicly agree on that. Um, and I think that's that's critical because at, at Ofcom, what we are trying to do with our risk assessment framework is very much trying to get to a point where they are not an end in themselves, but rather a means to an end. And the end that we are looking for is trying to engender a culture of responsibility and a culture of risk management within the companies who we are regulating. Because ultimately, when you talk to parents about the harms that they fear that their children face online, or when you talk to marginalized groups who are at greater risk of hate speech and so forth, they don't care that companies do risk assessments. What they care about is that companies are adequately addressing the risks that they face as people using those services. So I think that's an area where I think we're, we're going to have a bit of work to do because we're starting off in our respective jurisdictions with risk assessment frameworks. But ultimately, I think we all want that to go somewhere farther. We want a risk culture which permeates how companies operate their services, how they run their governance and how ultimately how they how they run their businesses. And this is an aspect where I think we often say at Ofcom that trust and safety professionals can be our biggest allies. Because very often within companies, there are people who know what risks they face and how those risks are best addressed. The challenge in the past is very often these kind of interests within internal decision making have not been the overriding ones or have not been the ones which get the most attention. And so we hope that through regulation and through mandating different forms of risk assessments that you can increase the relative power and the relative importance of those voices within companies. And that's again an area where I think we can learn something from financial services because I think in financial services, we don't talk about risk assessments per se, but we talk about services risk appetite and their risk models and generally how they are mitigating the various types of risks that they that they may face. Um, and the final point I will make is just that the DSA's risk assessment framework, like the risk assessment framework we have in the UK and, and, and elsewhere, these are only just getting started and there's so many questions which we are only starting to think about now and which will only become clear as these regimes materialize and mature and i feel that one thing which we which we constantly have to um remind ourselves is that this is going to be an iterative process we are a little bit learning as we do and also that all stakeholders are going to have a role to play in kind of maximizing the potential and the impact of these these kind of new regulatory tools and both uh, yours and maria luisa mentioned the role of a broader set of stakeholders beyond the companies and the regulators so speaking about academia and civil society and and so forth and i think that our sector probably has a greater opportunity to leverage that kind of independent expertise in a broader policy community than many other sectors. And even I see in, in our own work at Ofcom, we, we look very closely at what independent experts are proposing for how things like risk assessment should be undertaken or how we should be assessing different types of harms and acting upon them because we know that there is a lot of expertise in that policy community so it's, this is i guess i would end on a call to action that if you if you have views on how risk assessment should be undertaken or how services can better manage risk or how regulators can 
influence and engender that culture, I think now is the is the moment to to share those views that there is this is the time when a lot of these questions are being resolved. And so there is a, a constant and uh, unending need for for expertise and, uh, and good guidance. So I'll end on that point and hand back to you, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you very much, Owen. I, I especially like the, the idea of a risk culture that is being fostered or facilitated through, through this uh, process. I, I think that, that is, a, that is a, um, a, a definitely a takeaway. That, that uh, brings us back uh, uh, to, to uh, the, the two co-authors of uh, uh, the report, and I would like to give them the opportunity to respond to, to the very interesting ideas that have been mentioned. And let me just add one uh, a point, uh, and, and maybe Sally or Andrea, if, if you would like to, to respond. Um, you have mentioned uh, in your presentation that one of the issues is that there is a lack of clear indicators or thresholds uh, to, to identify, to, to assess uh, uh, failures uh, or risks. Uh, is it possible to uh, develop such uh, indicators, maybe even quantitative indicators? Will, will we see at the end, once the, the process has matured, something like a risk scorecard? Or would, would that be an oversimplification of, uh, of uh, the, the, the process? Uh, who, who would like to, to respond? <laughs> Sally, maybe? Well, uh, <laughs> Andrea, who's the economist, might disagree, but <laughs> I think we're not looking for, for, just, for just quantitative measures. You know, I think... Um, an absolute scorecard type system is going to be a bit counterproductive to the types of harm and risk areas that we're talking about. Um, and um, I want to come back to, to something that Owen mentioned about this being um, not risk assessments, not being an end in themselves. And I think that we, we have starting off with the first risk assessments that were you know, supplied at the end of August, which I guess we will be seeing sometime next summer, um, is probably a process of continual feedback loops, right? Everybody's going to be learning and also these systems change. So we're going to have to be constantly re-examining the risk, re-examining the situation and feeding back into what kind of mitigations are appropriate. And and, and, and Joris mentioned that the DSA kind of takes a rights-based approach and squeezes it, it into a risk management approach. And, 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 and yes, that's definitely the case. We're, at, we're taking a risk management approach and trying to deal with very delicate things like the balancing of fundamental rights, right? What is, you know, when you're trying, how do you do that? Uh, editors have been balancing fundamental rights all the time in an editorial responsibility type position. But when a platform has to do it using a risk management approach, the risk to one, the risk to the other, how do they do that? And what, what Andrea and I have been saying is we really can't have them just doing that by themselves or sort of in collaboration with one of the big auditing companies that they happen to be being audited by at the time. Um, and and that will bring me me back to this idea of the multi-stakeholder approach. And, and Maria Luisa had some um, you know, clear suggestions. The DSA itself, in one of the recitals, I can't remember the number, but calls for the development of European level expertise in this area, right? And it gives the commission as the regulator of these very large services and the digital services board, which is created by the DSA, some pretty explicit convening power <laughs> And I would say almost convening obligation <laughs> in terms of multi-stakeholders. Um, and when Andrea and I were looking at um, the plans for the rules for auditing that we fed back to, there's also requirements that audits involve multi-stakeholders in the process. Now, you can imagine with, you know, not quite 20 um, designated services, <laughs> How, you know, what an organization like Article 19, ha what capacity would, you know, would, would Maria herself, Maria Luisa herself have to be involved in 19 different audits, <laughs> right? That's not, you know, that's not possible. On the, so there's going to have to be some kind of channeling of that multi-stakeholder involvement, right? Because it's just not possible given the resources of various stakeholders that they're all going to be involved in every single audit and every single assessment. So where I see that to be most critical 
is in the benchmarking, the definitional report. What actually do we mean by negative effects on civic discourse or in relation to gender violence, right? What is it that we're actually supposed to be mitigating? And when we see the results of the first round of systemic risk assessments, we're going to see what the platforms think, right? We're going to see what the service providers think. Ofcom is doing work on mapping risk areas. They're going to be doing risk profiles. There's that expertise. There's stuff going on also in other countries, right, in relation to these various online harms. So we're going to have to have some discussions, I think, once all of that is public about, okay, what is missing here, right? Are these balances of fundamental rights being achieved appropriately? What other input is necessary? And there's going to have to be some kind of sort of centralized process or, or not everyone's going to have the capacity to, um, to, take, to take into account. And that, that's where these indicators, I think, need to be done. And, and not scorecard type indicators, but more kind of holistic, qualitative there are going to be quantitative aspects too, probably, but more qualitative um, elements to it. Andre, do you want to add anything? Or? Yes, thank you. Thank you <laughs> to all the panelists for the questions. And Christopher, you reignited a conversation that Sally and I had multiple times about, okay, how we will measure. Are we going to be more qualitative or quantitative? And my applied economy background would say well we should try to measure everything as much as we can the reality is that this is very complex and uh, there will be some sort of limitations especially for certain types of risk areas in how much we can measure most likely that's my forecast it could be a completely wrong forecast and again i would be more than happy to have something more quantitative certainly these risk measures mm, proxies mm, will be tailored, as we were saying during the initial presentation, to the risk area, to the typology develop, the business type, their algorithm, and, and the type of risk that is more relevant for that risk area, the network that they have, and so on and so forth. Time is going to matter if it's a certain type of uh, of, of shock, uh, the reaction will most likely need to be immediate for other types. There will need more time to decide. So in that sense, uh, uh, it's something that uh, uh, the same VLOPS will probably need some help and the multi-stakeholder stakeholder approach will provide them. I, I will not hide that there might be mistakes at the beginning because this is, as Owen said, a very learning by doing practice. It's all completely new. It's true, we are borrowing something from a different field, but applying to this field, which is rather complex, always evolving, is going to be tricky. And then I see that someone could be a little bit pessimistic that it could end up in nothing. Uh, I'm less pessimistic than this view. I think that if well properly addressed, it could provide at least some minimum. And that's what we would like to say some minimum standards that are achieved. And I remember that there was a question, a key question, I would say, because these are all businesses, uh, who is bearing the cost? If I think about what happens in um, for banking stress, stress testing, the banks themselves, they provide the, the data to uh, the, the European Central Bank, it would be the SSM in that case, or the Federal Reserve for the US, and uh, so most of the costs are burned by the companies themselves. Of course, there will be some organizational and assessment cost on the uh, on the um, regulator itself. And if you think about the auditing companies, the financial reporting and sustainability uh, auditing companies that are all paid by the banks themselves. So I suspect that it will be equally translated to the case of platforms, and in my opinion, this is what will make sense. Also in the context, even if the topic is very different, the field is very different, but I am pretty sure that it's going to work like this. To be fair, now all these platforms have many algorithms, so most of the information they can easily access. What could be a cost is for them to change their algorithms when they learn 
learning by doing that to monitor, to assess and to intervene, they may need to have a different way that a few parts of the algorithm works. That clearly will require expertise, will require a lot of conceptual thinking, and that is clearly an additional cost. So certainly costs are going to increase and the ultimate, the ultimate um, payers are the final consumers, of course, as it is always the case. And the taxpayers in the case of the regulator. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, Andrea. As, as I'm currently in Scotland, uh, please allow me to quote Lord Kelvin, who I think was at Glasgow University and, and said in a different context, if you cannot measure it, if you cannot put numbers to it, you cannot improve it. Well, may, maybe that does not apply to, to the quality of, of the civic discourse or the mental well-being of platform users. So, so there, there's definitely a a, a, a challenge uh, uh, here, but I've seen that Owen has raised uh, his hand. You, you would like to jump in on this point, right? Yes, yeah, just on, on that point, it's kind of, it's one of those things which when I guess we were drafting and debating the Digital Services Act and the Online Safety Bill, it's not a question which probably was top of people's minds, like what are the metrics and what are the evaluation toolkits to make these risk assessments work, but now it is the probably the fundamental question we need to address and get right. And to speak from the experience of Ofcom on this question, um, we're, we're lucky to have quite a generous research budget. And I guess something that we probably spend most of our commissioned research budget on is trying to answer questions about measurement and evaluation and metrics. Like we, we have a pretty good idea about what the risks and what the harms are online, as in it's, it's not it's not hard. You just need to use the Internet to have a sense of what those risks and harms are. But what is much harder to figure out and measure is what are the drivers of those harms? And also, what are the types of mitigations and measures which might reduce them? Some things are easier to define. We know, for instance, certain functionalities give rise to certain risks, but in other cases it can be harder. And also, for instance, knowing, for instance, how does your user base affect your risk profile? If you're aiming your service at children, do, does that open up a different type of risk factors that might not otherwise exist if your service was just aimed at adults? So figuring out those and figuring out the types of measures which better respond, which respond to them is really quite a, quite a challenging endeavor and something which we can't really borrow much from other sectors. We have to figure this out for ourselves as a community. And obviously, like, regulators and the research community have a critical role to play there, as do obviously the companies who have all the data. This is, an, I think Joris mentioned earlier on, the Article 40 provisions in the Digital Services Act, this idea about um, giving uh, re uh, independent researchers access to platform data. That's a really interesting provision because hopefully it will help us get a bit more of the types of data that we, we need to, to make these assessments and develop the, the right kind of metrics. I think for one of the things that we're thinking about as as a regulator is how do we how do we support the the research community in like asking the right questions and developing the right methodologies which can contribute towards regulatory change because there's very different types of research questions you can ask different types of methodologies you can employ but not all of those are suitable for the kind of tasks we have when it comes to regulatory supervision and enforcement so that's something which is big on our agenda is about how to how to leverage the fact that we have new tools for access to data and how to use them and how to stimulate their application so that we start to get the right learnings that can influence the metrics and the indicators we use to to implement these regimes. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let me bring in a question from the audience, which which I have just received, and it um, I think it has been triggered by by the conversation that that we just had. And the question is, given the inherent difficulties with defining and assessing uh, systemic risks, uh, in different uh, uh, types of uh, VLOPs, uh, what approach does the panel anticipate the Commission might take to the first round of audits? We, 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 we've seen it. it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that needs to mature, but we have to start now, or the Commission has to start now. 
what do you think? How will they start? What uh, will be the, the approach of the Commission? Maybe, maybe Joris, would, would you like to, to respond to this? Yeah, this is a, I mean, this is a question that's on everybody's mind, of course, uh, what is going to happen. So, I mean, the Commission has flagged a few areas that they're particularly interested in. You know, I think they have flagged illegal content. We can imagine particular types of illegal content receiving particular attention. I think we, we if some inside predictions are, are possible uh, there. Uh, and also elections, uh, that is an area which they take a very active interest with a bunch of uh, important elections also upcoming. You know, so I, I think we will see a little bit of that. I think we will see definitely uh, the Commission trying to do things in ways that keep things open for improvement in, uh, in next versions. Uh, but I think we can also imagine uh, that they want to show that this can offer some real value. I think we've uh, se uh, seen multiple uh, senior commission officials making it very clear that this, this should not just be some paper tiger, this should not just be a bunch of paperwork. They want to really make this uh, 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 create some value. I do think we'll also maybe see a bunch of really more kind of political influences in the way that this all uh, is working, some kind of uh, sheriff of the internet uh, kind of behavior uh and and things like that and that is a little bit more tricky we do have also uh european elections of course upcoming so that is uh, something that i'm a little bit more concerned about um that is also one of the reasons why i think ultimately oversight by the commission has to be structured uh in a more kind of separated independent kind of way than uh, the way it's uh, set up set up now within uh, within the commission but I think, I mean, overall, I think we, we know certain areas are going to maybe receive some additional attention, uh, some services, uh, you know, especially maybe X. We've seen it also now uh, in this week, uh, receive maybe some particular attention. But then I think we'll, we'll definitely see the, the Commission try to really make this uh, framework deliver some value, but leaving it open to, to offer more value in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're, we're already coming a bit closer to the end of, of our 75 minutes, but I would like to give uh, the other panelists uh, uh, also the opportunity to, to give a sort of uh, a closing statement. And then the very, very last word belongs to, to the co-authors, uh, of, of course. Um, uh, Luisa, uh, what, what would be your takeaway from, from our discussion? Maria Luisa. <laughs> well, as I said at the very beginning, uh, I think uh, this is good to set the agenda. Uh, so <laughs> I, I do believe that the main takeaway is uh, let's have these other nine uh, meetings that I mentioned at the beginning and let's see where we get after after those nine. Uh, but being a little bit more focused on and, and taking, you know, um, uh, advantage of the, the very last question has been asked. I do believe that, yes, there will be risk areas where the Commission is going to be focusing a little bit more. I also believe that maybe we want to also do a step back and look at a broader picture. There's some risks in the DSA, they're also relevant for other regulatory frameworks, like the risk on, on plurality of the media is absolutely uh, one of the main, I think, challenges that the European Commission try, tries to solve with the proposal for the Media Freedom Act. Uh, there is the A Act being discussed, uh, there is the DMA that starts to be implemented. Um, so when we were thinking about a multi-stakeholder process and the idea that we need to create new things and uh, learn from doing, uh, we might also want to include in the uh, picture the interactions slash overlaps of these regulatory frameworks and the possible cooperation and coordination between the different regulatory authorities that will be involved and their priorities, because each of them will come to the stage, to the desk, uh, to the table, sorry, with their own set of priorities and goals. And we might need to find a way also to create sort of a, uh, uh, yeah, hierarchies or cooperation in between these public goals as well. Thank you. Owen, what, what's your key takeaway from, from our conversation? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be very quick and just, I think, reiterate one of the points I made earlier um, that, yes, indeed, this is this is the beginning of a long and iterative process. And I look forward to the nine other dialogues and the many other we will need to have about this uh, in the future. I guess the, the one small contribution that that we can make going forward as Ofcom is in early November, we will be publishing our draft risk assessment guidance on our set of risk profiles, which are effectively about helping services undertake risk assessments and also helping them understand how risk might manifest on their services. Now, obviously, there's not a direct overlap with the DSA systemic risk assessment because we're measuring slightly different things, but we hope that that guidance can start to help answer some of the questions that we're all collectively grappling with. Um, in, in today's conversation, obviously, but indeed, this is going to be a much longer process and we uh, will probably get, get the answers iteratively over time. Thank you so much. And this brings us to the uh, final words of the co-authors. Uh, and Andrea, uh, if, if you could summarize in one sentence uh, uh, your key learning from this conversation, what would that be? It would be that we have to work hard on the methodology, I would say. So, uh, the the questions that we received, I think they are great, uh, and also the one from from the Q and A, it's a key question. The reality is that this is like a pilot. So the European Commission, first of all, we have to understand uh, whether they got relevant information, and it's very likely that different platforms provide a, a different detailed set of information. So it's going to be quite a lot of learning to. Uh, better define in a very primitive way the risk areas and attempt to to see whether there are there is, what is the the standard so who is above or below the standard but then it's going to be key that's my personal opinion that the European Commission opens up this floor to the multi stakeholder uh, uh, approach because uh, as all of us said, and we all agree in this, uh, this is an iterative game that is going to be repeated. It will take time before that everything is fine-tuned. And even when it's going to be fine-tuned, we know system changes uh, because ultimately there are people behind everything, despite that there is artificial intelligence now apparently everywhere, but there are people behind mm -hmm. and people can change. So things may have there might be some definitional work more in the medium run than in the short run, but I'm sure that there will be quite a lot of feedback loop also in very periodic moments. So yes, that's my takeaway. Thank you so much. I think pilot is a very fitting metaphor for what what uh, uh, for for the process that that has just been started. Sally, what you you have the the last word, the final uh, word. Uh. Thank you. It's my my academic co-director privilege. Uh, so first, let me thank all the panelists for their very um, insightful questions and comments, and the comment from there. Um, one thing I'll say is, you know, we're we're looking at one thing that really struck me out of our work was. We should be thinking about this not just as the risk of the individual platform, how much can they resist the shock of disinformation related to election or voter suppression tactics or something, but also how, you know, these risks exist outside in society, you know, how much is any given service itself contributing to the overall risk of to of voter suppression or the impact of disinformation on an election? So these are things going to be very complex. Um, I'll finish by saying Andrea and I have not stopped working here. We have a next phase of the project where we are going to be diving deeply into particular risk areas and looking very carefully at expectations for assessment, expectations for measurement. Um, measurement not necessarily being quantitative um, and um, and we look forward to um, having another uh, discussion very soon. Thank you so much and uh, I, I would certainly not summarize our discussion but but let me let me uh, just say this is just the beginning of uh, a discussion and I'm sure that uh, uh, there will be and uh, Sally mentioned uh, this already there there will be more work from from Sal uh, uh, also on on this topic and 
and I'm I'm very happy to to see all of you again for the continuation of this uh, process. So please stay tuned with us, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.